Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for a new season of Upfront. U.S. democracy is in crisis and at the risk of failing. That's what a majority of Americans believe, according to a recent Ipsos NPR poll. From the January 6th insurrection at the Capitol to the dismantling of voting rights and deep economic inequality exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic, is democracy imperiled in the United States? And if so, what can be done to save it? We'll ask the world-renowned author, scholar, and political activist, Noam Chomsky. Professor Chomsky, thank you so much for joining us on Upfront. Very pleased to be with you. Uh, here in the United States, Professor, you have talked about how 90 percent of the population uh, is basically not represented by political leaders due to concentrated wealth and private power determining uh, the outcomes of elections. Uh, 34 laws restricting access to voting were passed in 2021 alone. Uh, do we have a real democracy here in the United States? We have a mixed form of democracy. Uh, the, the, in some respects, the United States is quite advanced. I don't think there's any country that uh, protects freedom of speech to the extent that the United States does. Uh, if you're moderately privileged, you're secure, safe from state authority, and so on. Uh, on the other hand, the uh, political system uh, does not uh, represent the population. There are extensive studies in academic political science, mainstream, which uh, ask a very simple question. Uh, what's the relation between people's attitudes and opinions and the votes of their own representatives? Straightforward. Turns out that for a large majority of the population, by some studies up to 90 percent, uh, there's essentially no correlation. Their representatives are listening to different voices. And that's understandable. If you're elected to the House of Representatives, uh, the first thing you have to do is get on the telephone and make sure that the donors will be ready, ready to uh, finance your next election. Uh, there, other studies have shown that the uh, you can predict election electability with very high precision uh, simply by looking at things like concentrated strategic campaign funding. Uh, the uh, while the legislators calling the donors, the, uh, the legislator's office is being flooded with lobbyists, uh, corporate lawyers, uh, representatives of investment firms, uh, overwhelming the staff, uh, huge amounts of uh, materials, and ends up with them pretty much uh, 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 writing the legislation, which the legislator then signs. Now, this is a bit of a caricature, but not too much. Something like that is essentially the way much of the system operates. So it's a, it's a democracy in many respects. There's a lot of freedom, uh, but the representative system is constrained. Constrained. Uh, another thing that comes up, in addition to the kind of constraints around the electoral system, influence, power, money, all the things that you're speaking about, is the actual preservation of voting rights. Uh, there have been efforts to pass some reforms on voting rights lately in the United States, most recently uh, the Freedom to Vote Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. Uh, these would have restored vital uh, voter protections. Uh, they would have prevented dist districts from changing voting laws in a way that systematically uh, disenfranchises minority populations. Um, both bills killed in the Senate. Uh, can you explain how voter suppression and disenfranchisement are predominantly impacting minorities in the United States and why voting rights, which are a pillar of democracy, could be under attack in the 21st century? Well, first of all, the United States used to have two political parties, Democrats and Republicans. 
uh, from another point of view, uh, they were two factions of the same party, the business party. The business part, the business world is overwhelmingly dominant in both of them. Uh, nevertheless, they were, they have been somewhat different with some overlap. In the last uh, 30 or 40 years, one of these, the Republican Party, has simply drifted off the spectrum. It's not a political party in the traditional sense. Uh, about 10 years ago, two leading political analysts for the conservative American Enterprise Institute, uh, Thomas Mann, uh, Norman Ornstein, wrote an article in which they described the Republican Party of 10 years ago as, in their words, a radical insurgency that has abandoned any interest in participation in parliamentary politics. What do you think causes this radical departure from the values and the position that the Republican Party was in even 10 years ago, much less 30 or 40? There's always been an ideological difference and divergence, but as you said, they seem to have fallen off the map almost by over the last 10 years. Why? I mean, this goes back to Richard Nixon, actually, uh, 50 years ago. Uh, Nixon, who was intelligent statesman, understood that the Republicans, who are more oriented than the Democrats towards corporate power and private wealth, uh, cannot win elections on their own programs. You can't approach the electorate and saying, I want to stab you in the back, enrich the rich, and empower the corporate sector. It doesn't work. So they had to turn to other issues, what are called cultural issues. Uh, Nixon began it with what was called the Southern Strategy. Uh, Democrats had been supporting Johnson's uh, civil rights acts that caused great resentment among the deeply racist uh, Southern Democrats. Uh, Nixon recognized that by hinting, you didn't have to say it in words, but by hinting that the Republicans would become the white supremacist party, he could win over the Southern Democrats. That was the Southern strategy. Worked pretty well. Uh, then they moved to other issues. By the mid-70s, Republican strategists recognized that if they pretended, I stress pretended, to be opposed to abortion, uh, they could win the huge evangelical vote, 25% of the population. Northern Catholics. So they all switched on a dime. Uh, Reagan, George H.W. Bush had always been what we call pro-choice, but all of a sudden they became passionately anti-abortion, uh, next to uh, guns, next to other things. Trump uh, was extreme. He carried this. This is after the commentary that I mentioned on the radical insurgency. But Trump, quite brilliantly, was able to tap the poisons that run right below the surface in American society. There, there might be. Professor, speaking of this idea of an insurrection uh, and, and Trump, I mean, we had an actual attack on the Capitol on January 6th of 2021, which you described as an attempted coup. Uh, some have said that the United States is still witnessing a slow motion insurrection by Republicans and that they're using uh, election theft or they're at least plotting election theft. According to the state's United Democracy Center last year, at least 262 bills were introduced in 41 states that would interfere with elections. Is our democracy being subverted through the electoral process? And, and what relationship does it have to, to Trump and this right wing insurgency that you're talking about? Well, Trump has managed to mobilize a popular cult of uh, worshipful followers. Uh, uh, anything he does, they support. And they've basically taken over the Republican Party, or what used to be the Republican Party. Uh, Republican leaders are groveling at his feet, afraid to offend him in any way. Uh, Trump has made it very clear, more clear in the last few days, 
that he does not believe that the United States should have a functioning democracy. He's said explicitly that the vice president, Mike Pence, could have overturned the election and failed to do it. It was Pence's failure, his fault, that the election was not overturned uh, and handed over to Trump. He said it quite explicitly. Uh, there's no uh, effort in Congress to... The Constitution happens to be rather vague about this. Uh, nobody in the last 250 years really thought about the possibility that one of the, the political party could arise which wants to overthrow the democratic system. So the laws are a little bit obscure. And there is there are debates going on right now in Congress as to whether to sharpen the rules to make it clearer that the voters uh, should be in charge, not uh, elect, not officials who want to overturn the vote. Trump's against it, and it's not clear how the Republican Party will act on this. But you're correct. There are hundreds of bills in state legislatures, Republican ones, working on various ways to ensure that they can become a permanent uh, dominant minority party by excluding the votes of uh, the wrong kind of people. Professor Chomsky, I keep hearing this word party. I hear Republican. I hear Democrat a lot. And, and I have to ask you, I mean, is there too much focus on parties, too much focus on party affiliation and partisanship? It seems like people might be caught up in this idea of winning uh, at any cost rather than creating functional democracy, functional government, and safeguarding the protections that we're supposed to have in our society. Is, is, that, is that an accurate assessment? Well, if you go back to the days before the Republican Party drifted off the spectrum, there was cooperation between the parties. And in fact, I've, I've voted for Republicans, moderate Republicans, uh, but by now that's just inconceivable. Republicans have just become a denialist party. Actually, this precedes Trump. When President Obama was elected, Mitch McConnell, Senate leader for the Republicans and maybe the most influential person in the party, when Obama was elected, McConnell said straight out that, I, that the Republicans have one goal, make sure that he cannot achieve anything, make sure that the country is ungovernable, and then the blame can be put on the re on the Democrats who happen to have power, and Republicans can come back into office. Doing exactly the same thing now. When Joe Biden was elected, McConnell, Senate Minority Leader, said very explicitly, our goal is to ensure that he can achieve nothing. We'll harm the country as much as possible, and we will then blame it on the Democrats, and we'll come back to power. That's not a political party. That's a radical insurgency. No interest in democracy. But is there any room for critique of the Democratic Party as well? I mean, the rise of the right in this way, in some ways, has to do, some would argue, with the Democratic Party's failure to address the needs of working people, and that capitalism itself is part of the problem. And because Democrats are fully on board with the system, uh, that they are as complicit and culpable uh, in our failure to have a, an effective functional democracy as anybody else. What you say is quite accurate, and this goes back 45 years to President Carter. By the time the late 1970s, the Democrats, they were not going to be the party of working people anymore. They were going to become a party of... Uh, affluent professionals and Wall Street, the kind of people, incidentally, who showed up at uh, Obama's extravagant parties. Uh, Chuck Schumer, who's now the Senate Majority Leader, said straight out that uh, we can uh, maybe we'll lose a working class vote in western Pennsylvania, but we'll pick up two uh, uh, affluent suburban votes. 
So that's what we'll do. And the last effort of the, Rep of the Democrats to serve working people was in 1978, uh, the Humphrey Hawkins Full Employment Act did pass Congress. President Carter didn't veto it, but he watered it down so that it had almost no bite. At that point, the Democrats basically handed the working class over to their class enemy. The Republicans are the bitter enemy of the working class. Uh, Democrats handed it over to them. Reagan came along. His first act was to smash labor unions, opening the door to the corporate sector to do the same, initiated programs which have severely harmed the working class and the middle class. We actually have measures of this. The Rand Corporation, super respectable, recently did a study on how much wealth had been transferred from the lower 90% of the population, working class, middle class, the poor, how much wealth had been transferred to the super rich during the last 40 years yeah. since Reagan. Their estimate is about $50 trillion. Wow. That's a, that's a, that, is a staggering, that is a staggering number. Professor, there, there, even on the issues that you're raising, where there is a considerable shift in a direction that might be, in some estimation, anti-democratic, there's still a lot of Americans who are lined up in support of policies that often maybe undermine their own best interests. Uh, you wrote a seminal book, Manufacturing Consent. Uh, and you talk about how leaders sometimes can't necessarily control people by force, like in a dictatorship, but they control people's thinking, they control how they act, and this often results in people operating against their own interests. Talk to me a little bit about the media. What role does the media play in manufacturing consent? What role does the media play in undermining uh, democracy in the United States? Well, for example, one thing they do is not discuss what you and I have just been discussing. They act as if there are two political parties, both uh, dedicated to the benefit of the population. What you and I have just been discussing, um, and you can find hints of it here and there, but the public doesn't see it. And in fact, this, the effects are very striking. So take Congress right now, one of the main legislative programs that Biden put forth is the uh, Build Back Better program. The, uh, it's a program which would greatly benefit working people, poor parents, children, very beneficial to the population. Republicans, of course, are 100% opposed and a few Democrats are opposed, right-wing Democrats, and since Congress is split, can't get through. Take a look at public opinion. It's very striking. When, you, when the public is asked about the individual provisions of this program, that are medical care, child credits, and so on, they're in favor of it. When they're asked what they think about the program, they're opposed to it. When you ask, do you know what's in the program? No, they don't. It's an interesting collection. They're in favor of the individual measures. They do not know that those are in the program. They're opposed to the program because it's being presented on Fox News, other right-wing media, as a government attack on you, which is just going to uh, raise the deficit and, you know, you won't be able to pay for it. And it's just going to the undeserving poor. There's an undertone there that says, uh, well, there are these people who don't want to work, uh, the ones that Reagan called the, uh, uh, the welfare cheats, black mothers going in limousines to the Social Security office to rob your welfare. That's the undertone. And uh, uh, somehow those people back there who are worthless and don't work are taking it all away from us. 
And it's an old technique to try to divert the attention of people away from their true oppressors to people who are even more disadvantaged than they are. That's one of the ways in which the white working class was kept down for a century in much of the country. Get them to hate black people who are even worse off than they are. If you can make them think, well, I'm better than those guys, then you can exploit them and repress them. It's been a familiar technique of crushing working class organization. Yeah. Working people knew this, incidentally. You take a look at the great labor movement of the 19th century, Knights of Labor, enormous labor movement, uh, bitterly opposed to industrial capitalism. Their first organizing effort, first one, was in Louisiana, black workers working in the cotton fields. They'd been driven back to something virtually like slavery. So the Knights of Labor began to organize among them. It was very successful, black and white organizing together. Local officials, local people, and in this town in Louisiana, Thibodeau, Louisiana, they heard about it. They organized, organized militias, called in the state, uh, uh, state troopers, carried out a huge massacre. We don't even know how many people were killed because nobody even could check. The thing was devastated to try to block this black-white organizing effort. Brutal, vicious massacre. Well, that was the first, went on in many others, goes on in many other ways. I go back to my childhood, the early 1930s. Uh, the labor movement was reviving. CIA was organizing industrial workers. Black and white workers were working together. When they were joined in the labor action, the ethnic race conflicts dissolved, just as in the early efforts of the Knights of Labor. Uh, the employer wants to stop that, always. P Professor, uh, I have just a few minutes left. Uh... And I have to ask you, you've been writing about capitalism, uh, power, and democracy for decades. Given where we are right now, the state of our democracy, do you see a way forward? Are you still hopeful? There's always a reason to be hopeful. We have a political... The, I've just mentioned briefly the impact of 40 years of neoliberal attacks on the population. Uh, it's caused extreme social breakdown and disorder, uh, fertile terrain for a demagogue like Trump or DeSantis of Florida or Tucker Carlson or whoever come next. But there is a revival of sane, decent, honest commitment to a better world. You saw it pretty dramatically after the George Floyd murder. Huge uprising, black and white, biggest in American history, calling for an end to violent repression against Afro-Americans. Enormous support. Well, it came under attack, beaten back, still there. Now, there are young people, organized, active, working very hard to overcome the most serious crisis that humans have ever faced in their history, destruction of the environment. There are other groups working for racial justice, uh, for recognition of human rights. They're all over. It's very, they're not, they don't have wealth, concentrated power, uh, media support, but they're there and they can become the wave of the future. It's up to us to support them, participate with them. Professor Chomsky, thank you so much for joining us on Upfront. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you. All right, that's our show. Upfront, we'll be back next week.